Hi, uh, everybody. Um, before we actually start the uh, slides, right, may I get uh, Anna and Tim to help me launch the poll that you have uh, prepared for me? Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm actually very curious out of this 200 over people that we see here. Do you think resilience can be nurtured? Yes or no? Okay, all right, I think we can end the poll for now. So uh, let's see the results. Mm, okay, so from what we see, right, uh, about 95% feels that it's a yes, about 3% say no, and 2% is unsure. Okay, so having seen this actually is quite uh, hopeful to see that most of you actually felt that it can be nurtured. And I really want to share with you how I have seen this in the people that I work with and the youth that I interacted uh, with as well. So um, in the workplace that I'm in, right, I actually work with youth, uh, mainly in the age of between 12 to 35 years old. Uh, and this place is called Singapore Association for Mental Health, uh, SCMH Create DC. All right, so I'm actually going to share a story of my um, participant that, I, that we work with very closely uh, to highlight about how in her journey, uh, together with us, how we learn about the little tips that really help in building her resilience. And I think it's something that can be taken away from many one of us as well, including myself as I journey this with her. Yeah, so I hope that you can also get a glimpse into how it was like for her and perhaps find something useful for yourself. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to share screen with you. Again, welcome to this uh, session here. Yeah, so um, my workplace is actually started since 1968. We are considered a social service agency. Um, most of our program are actually sponsored by certain uh, ministries and bodies. However, the program that I'm from, right, purely SMH Creative say our program is actually sponsored through donation and also the outreach uh, that we manage to gather for our team, meaning like, for example, external workshops, towards that we can actually, uh, that people engage us and that's where uh, our funding's uh, support come from. This is uh, where I work, as image creative say. Um, a lot of time, we actually believe in the use of creative arts, music, dance, drama, or even sports and outdoors as a way to create wellness. Um, what we really hope is at the end of the day, right? Um, wellness can be maintained straight from the beginning rather than when someone is not doing too well. And then that's where they have to seek uh, other form of uh, support like psychiatrists or even going to their doctors. Yeah, so we really hope that a prevention can come in, a model where people who um, come in um, to really be curious about themselves and using creative platform to express and know about themselves and others. Yeah, so we are actually located in the north where Marsling is, for those uh, located in Singapore, we are right near to Marsling MRT. And our office is actually residing underneath like a block of uh, HDB flats, really just to make it accessible to people in the community. So that's one concept that I would really want to highlight to you straight at, from the beginning. Um, I'm sure some of you might have heard this called window of tolerance. And how does this really um, relate to resilience? So let me, uh, allow me to share a little bit more here. So it's a concept that is introduced by Daniel Siegel uh, in the early days. And after that, quite a number of people start using this as a way to understand themselves and also uh, the, the people that they work with. Okay, so if you look at this window here, all right, and you see this black curve, this represents how perhaps our nervous system works when we are in face with our daily tasks, our daily stresses in life. Okay, and it kind of go up and down, meaning, for example, um, say you are uh, probably doing something and then suddenly there was a task coming in, whether is it from your school or is it from your bosses at work, um, it might escalate and bring you a little bit of stress. Perhaps she told you that, oh, your paper has to be submitted tomorrow. You're kind of um, 
needing to let me see the draft first. How come I haven't seen your draft? Okay, so that might bring up some of your anxiety and stress. However, uh, with your experiences and also maybe good resources and also good connection with people around you, network, right, or support system, uh, you generally could meet the task demand. Uh, and then once you probably accomplish what you need to do, all right, your nervous system, your body start to relax and it goes down again, feeling, okay, I'm done. Now maybe I can have a cup of coffee. I can have a chat with my friends. Ah, so that's how our nervous system goes up and down throughout our daily experiences. Okay, can you imagine that? So it's also a little bit like you're jogging and you're just going uphill and you, you take a bit of energy going uphill. And then after that, when you go flat uh, on the flat ground, you, you felt that your heartbeat can go a bit lower. Okay, so that's how our nervous system works. Our body could actually track in this window of tolerance in managing the daily tasks, not to feel too overwhelmed, uh, yet feeling quite good that you can function well, you can thrive in your daily life. In fact, a lot of time you feel that you are very grounded. Uh, this is actually the best stage of arousal for you. Uh, very flexible, you're open, curious, curious to even uh, be thrown uh, certain challenges and you want to try, not rejecting uh, and very pleasant actually with the situation. Um, also very good regulation, meaning like you probably feel your heartbeat going up because you know that the task deadline is coming up. However, you are able to stay calm, uh, handle the task very grounded and uh, manage it pretty well. So in this window of tolerance, we see a lot resilient and adaptable. Okay, what would then throw us off this window of tolerance, right? Would be either you get what we call hyper arousal, where this um, curve, right, no longer fit into uh, this window of tolerance of yours. It kind of spill over. It gets um, a lot of energy, excessive activation going on in your nervous system that you feel really stressed. Um, and a lot of time is the fight and flight response. Uh, for example, right, um, if let's say an additional task is given to you uh, and they ask you to complete it within the time frame and given you a very short timeline, sometimes you might realize that you are fighting, meaning like you might get a bit annoyed, irritable, and even speak up or become not the usual you. You get probably a bit like this volcano, getting uh, really frustrated. And it may come across as a lot of anger, uh, anxiety, and even self-destruction uh, behaviors that we notice uh, in uh, people around us. For example, cutting, self-harm, uh, alcohol abuse, right, and substance abuse. Yeah. So a lot of time, the person might also feel that they are in this hypervigilant mode, uh, where some of the participants share with me, they'll be constantly looking out for danger. Uh, worried that people might be um, harming them. And can you imagine if, let's say, your mind uh, is constantly worried about uh, whether you'll be harmed, uh, whether um, uh, people are judging you, this, this um, mind will not, no longer be able functioning well, just like what we see here as the best day of arousal. Very hard to get grounded. Yeah, so a lot of flight response can also come in when a person starts to uh, avoid the task, or even find it very difficult to connect with people because maybe the stresses come with the people around them. Okay, so maybe some of you might also feel some of this uh, feeling where just like this picture here, feeling very overwhelmed. Mm. The other one that uh, constantly being shared is what we call the hyper arousal, where there's a sudden drop in the energy. So can you imagine, let's say you were fighting um, doing a lot of fighting, meaning with the expectation or things that set to you, felt very aroused, right? So a lot of energy goes up. And when this energy goes up so high, everything that goes up must come down, right? So naturally, there'll be a sudden drop. And sometimes this drop in energy, we call it hyper arousal, whereby the body starts to feel like you're freezing, uh, you feel like shutting down, you feel very numb to actually even understand what is going through in you. Uh, some people will share with me that their limbs are very, their hands and feet are very cold. Um, they cannot feel themselves. They, some may tell me, I don't know how to feel. All right? And to a certain extent, it may also drop into what we call depressive mood, uh, sometimes withdrawal, and even feeling very shameful of yourself. 
yeah, so this is definitely this window that is uh, overactivated. The nervous system could not keep up with the expectation of the daily, daily tasks and hence on go into either a very uh, hyper arousal mood or a hyper uh, hypo arousal mood. Oh, beg your pardon, there's a typo here. It should be hypo arousal. Okay, so the drop in energy. Yeah, so with this concept in mind, um, I'm going to actually share with you uh, a little story uh, of a person that we work with very closely over time um, where, where we actually get to see how she uh, grow her window of tolerance uh, and how her story actually also allow us as a staff working in the center learning more about how a body, how body works and how do we support someone who probably had a very narrow window of tolerance at the beginning. Yep, so this arrow just to share that if it's too much or too uh, aroused or under aroused, sometimes it will close out your window of tolerance as well. So stretching the window of tolerance definitely can nurture your resilience. Okay. So um, this participant has given me her permission to share her story here. Um, I personally met her last year um, during the um, COVID period. Uh, where she first came to us sharing that she really needs support, um, partly also because uh, she was not really talking a lot. A lot of times she's very quiet, very non-verbal. Um, hence, um, her counsellor was also encouraging her to reach out to us because Creative Say actually introduced a lot of approaches beyond talking uh, as a form of expression, as I mentioned, like arts, music, uh, movement, sports, right? So um, this participant came and joined us. I remember how it was like when I first um, met her. Um, she would probably stay quite a fair bit of distance from me, right? Not the usual distance, very really far away from me. Um, and a lot of time, if you imagine her shoulder will be um, going down, uh, her face will be looking downwards and almost like the body uh, really into this, what we call a collapse feeling. Yeah, and I remember even as she pressed the doorbell, there were times that this pressing doorbell can be very overwhelmed for her and she would even run away after pressing the doorbell because after that, who is going to open the door, who is going to talk to her might again uh, kind of create a lot of stress on her window of tolerance, right? So, so it took us a while where she started to feel okay to even step into the office. Some of the observation I have of her is when she first came, uh, she was really holding on very tightly to her bed. Uh, and she was also um, having a stuffed toy where she felt really um, helping her to soothe her anxiety. Uh, and when she was wa waiting to come into the space, right, uh, she was even um, sometimes hiding at corners so as to feel some security and not so vulnerable. Yeah. So to share a little bit of background on what, what is her growing up years like, uh, she shared that her parents were divorced at a very young age. Uh, she does really enjoy art making since young, but somehow the family members do not really see the need to do that or really don't really support her. Um, in the family culture and context, right, there's also a lot of no crying uh, and adults are always right kind of thinking. Uh, which makes it very difficult for her to even voice out her expression. She shared that somehow cleaning was like normal part of discipline for her. And she faced a lot of bullying in school as well in her growing up years, uh, especially in her primary school level. So in order to cope uh, as a young person, can you imagine someone so, so young at that time, right? Uh, being not able to get a lot of support from her own family as well. She starts to turn into her coping skills that, that helps her to survive until today. Yeah. So she at that point, she started biting herself um, and also went into what we call isolation, where she did not want to really make friends or connect with people because having a relationship with people seems very daunting and scary. Yeah. So she started to withdraw a lot yeah, from the social circle. She was also later on uh, diagnosed with uh, depression. Um, and that was uh, somewhere near to the age of about coming to 20 years old at that point. Yeah. 
So this is a little bit of backdrop to uh, let you know how things are on her end when we first know her and her background. So the learnings that we gather, right, is what we call healthy and safe relationships seems to work really well for her. Um, in our center, we are a very small team of about four people, four to five people. Um, so what we did was in order to make it safer for her to um, start uh, coming in, right, to feel welcome and join our center, uh, we actually allow uh, one of the colleagues to start interacting with her first so that it doesn't trigger her system too much. Remember the window of tolerance, she has been isolating herself from a lot of people. So we try not to have suddenly everybody trying to talk to her. We try to minimize uh, uh, that kind of conversation, but just have one key colleague holding space for her. And this colleague was really into art making and that was really helpful for her because this client really enjoy art making and uh, for her to connect with someone, uh, who can take her through more art skills based workshop would be very helpful at the beginning. So with a little bit of um, feeling comfortable with this person, the art facilitator, uh, slowly another colleague start to say hello, uh, start to welcome her and also make space for her to really uh, feel more at ease with us. Uh, and over time, gradually, uh, one by one, uh, we try to uh, build a relationship with her. Why we do that is because um, sometimes staff are not around, colleagues are on leave, or they might be attending to something else. And what if this participant needs some form of support? Uh, can we have some alternate resources for her as well? So uh, we are very glad to say that at this point, um, as this participant progressed with us this year, uh, we noticed that she can now open up very comfortably with most of us in the center whenever she call and she needs support. And that is really something that we are working towards that. So hearing this, I think you can imagine her window of tolerance start to stretch uh, in terms of her anxiety in meeting people. She start to feel safer and having include more healthy and safe uh, people in her life uh, over time. One thing that recently I had a convo with her knowing that I'm presenting, right? So I kind of checking in her to see where she's, uh, how is she doing? Uh, she shared with me what was really, really helpful was the staff did not come on to her at once, at one go. However, she knew she has someone consistent at the beginning to work with. And this is how she felt was really helpful for her. The other thing was very, a big thing in her was safety, right? Knowing about her background, sounded like things wasn't very safe for her since young. So we are also very mindful of the kind of boundary and safety that she needs uh, so that uh, we do not scare her away so that she could continue to come and uh, join us and uh, widen her resilience, right? So as she came uh, to us, if you see this picture here, there's this dotted line, really. I really feel this dotted line every time when she comes, whereby it's like a vibe given to me to say, please don't come so near. Really, you can sense it. I mean, if you're sensitive uh, when you um, kind of watch people, right? You know like how far or how near you can stand near the person. Yeah, so with that, that sensitivity, the staff are very uh, gentle. So we even uh, gave her the space she needs. Uh, sometimes really she tell us, I just want to sit and do nothing. Uh, I don't need anyone to talk to us. Yeah, so sometimes, right, all this thing is not conveyed to tra talking. It could be through text or even through email, something that is more uh, accessible for her at that point. And the next thing, I put this chair because a lot of our program in the center, right, requires some sitting down or even uh, within a space of uh, interaction. So in our center, we, our group size are really small, uh, not too big. So uh, with the chair lays out, right, generally we allow the participant to pick where they want to sit. And especially for participants who may have certain requests and we are aware and they could let us know, we will try to keep that place for them so that it kind of gives some form of safety for the participant as well. So for her, interestingly, um, what we notice is um, preferring also to sit more at the corner, right? And a lot of time, it could be also uh, being more accessible for her to exit the group. Uh, there's a little bit of agreement with her that anytime during the uh, workshop, 
right? If she feels uncomfortable by the, uh, the engagement going on or by the number of participants around, she can always uh, move to another space in the center and down-regulate herself. Yeah, so there's always this um, understanding being shared and something that she's aware of. And in fact, we actually work with her on what would be supportive uh, for her uh, rather than um, something that she would not be able to uh, manage. So it's something that we don't come up uh, the idea on, on our own. We actually collaborate a lot with her. So over time, she started at, off with more art skills workshop. Over time, the participants start to feel a lot safer. Uh, and she start to even go outside Creative Say and join some workshops that she wants to learn a skill from. And she picked a, a, a particular material that she's comfortable. Uh, and uh, to date, she has really gone many steps to achieve a certain accreditation. Um, and uh, later, I'll share a little bit more about how she then bring these skills back to Creative Say as well. Yeah, so we observed that over time uh, in the art skill session, she starts to feel like the routine or even the step-by-step -step guidance was really helpful for her nervous system. Because if it's someone who is already having a very narrow window of tolerance, right? If you suddenly um, gave a very spontaneous task to the person, it might uh, throw the person off the board. So there was a lot of guidance, step-by-step -step process that was really helpful. Um, and also a lot of assurance to her that even through this whole process, if you're not producing any outcome, or even any outward, it's fine because it's the process that we hope she could stay through and grow that um, resilient and tolerance towards being uh, with a group of people. So I must say that the participant herself was very open. She was at a motivation stage to, to make changes on shift in her life, just that she don't quite know how it can be taken uh, in steps that could help her. So I think with that, there was a lot of collaboration coming from her as well. Eventually, um, beyond just art skills workshop, during the COVID uh, circuit breaker period, right, last year, our center was closed for a period of time. Unfortunately, because of that, um, this participant uh, was being home most of the time and knowing that family was also a struggle for her, probably one of the core struggle, it didn't really help her in those uh, period of time when she has to stay at home more. Um, I remember her feedbacking or sharing with us how stressed she is, overhearing the quarrel, or even being involved in the family conflict. And it was really tough for her to um, focus in her own schoolwork. At that point, she was still schooling. Yeah. So, she, so what we did was we were not able to go back to office. So for me, I was being tasked to uh, kind of follow up closely with her during the circuit breaker period. Uh, and uh, I contacted her via WhatsApp call, texting, uh, on a quite regular basis, knowing that things were not very uh, going on very well for her. So with that connection, right, uh, somehow I became probably the third person or fourth person that she became safer to share more with me. Uh, and her perception of me from someone who is very fierce and daunting, it kind of shifted to actually I'm not so bad lah. So I'm very thankful that I had the opportunity with that uh, COVID uh, period to kind of grow a bond and also understanding with her. So over time, can you imagine at the beginning was very non-verbal, uh, very little conversation uh, to able to talk to me through the phone. And sometimes our phone call will take us about 30 to one hour to kind of support her because there's really no way that we can see her face to face at that point. So when, when things get a bit better, we are given permission to open up our center for uh, any of you who really need very important and crucial support. So what happened is one of my other colleagues starts to uh, conduct art therapy session for her. Uh, and uh, what I understand from my colleague and also the participant is it really took a process for them to grow that very therapeutic relationship uh, for her to feel really safe uh, to start opening up uh, about her struggles in an even uh, deeper level with the therapist. Uh, of course, it's never uh, smooth sailing at the beginning. There was a lot of struggle uh, for her to open up and for her to feel safe to actually uh, disclose uh, things that were bothering her. 
So my colleague shared with me that, the therapist shared with me that, uh, so a lot of time when the participant does not want to stay in the room or felt that she couldn't stay put uh, in the session from her body language, right? Uh, the therapist was very open to tell her that you can go now if you feel like it or do you want to go outside and take a seat somewhere? So all this um, flexibility was certainly uh, very useful to eventually grow this bond where they could really communicate a lot better uh, with very minimum um, miscom that was happening a lot at the beginning. So I think from there, there was a shift where once she gets to know herself better, her struggle, um, the participant starts to feel like she, she knows uh, how come she's feeling so overwhelmed, how come uh, her, you know, her body, her nervous system curve, the one that I show you, tend to either go into hyperarousal or hypoarousal. So with making sense, right, through art therapy really helps someone to know themselves better. And I think for all of us, once we know where our stresses come from, uh, anxiety stem from, uh, you definitely feel a little bit more at <clears throat> ease knowing what's going on in yourself. Yeah. And over time, uh, she started to join other things. Going to outdoors was really a, a turning point for her where she could uh, explore the outdoors with a few people, being curious, being immersed in the outdoors, also keep her very present with herself rather than feeling like she's either not here, not present, but she felt very connected with the nature and the curiosity starts to come out even more after the outdoor walks. And I guess, I think we all know those who love to walk or hike, you know how when your feet can get connected with the ground, it actually send uh, input back to your body and it's like you're connected to the earth kind of feeling. Yeah, so all this intervention that she even explored was really helpful. So what she shared with me was they, meaning CC, gave me the space that I need to, to warm up. Yeah, so that was also the very little, very small steps that we take with her. So with more um, knowledge gain, right, like she start to learn the art skills, right, uh, this participant start to give back, right, she went into, so my colleague who first engaged her for teaching her art skills went to her and asked her, hey, do you want to start facilitating workshop for us? since you already had some skill set uh, gain. Um, so, of course, it wasn't easy. It's something very daunting. It didn't, it didn't, she didn't take this up immediately. Um, my colleague did not give up. He kept pursuing uh, and also gave her a lot of assurance that there is a lot of guidance uh, and there wasn't going to be a time where she'll be left alone. Uh, he will support her, guide her step by step. We did a lot of trial run with her and she, she facilitated a workshop for the staff, and then eventually also for participants uh, for our creative services center. Um, subsequently, also start to volunteer for other forms of workshops, supporting the facilitator. And one thing that I really noticed was she even started mentoring other people in the program. And this is where she told me, uh, I really feel more useful as a person, yeah, as she engaged uh, through giving back to the community. So how is the participant now? As I round up the uh, last few minutes, she can express her emotion and thoughts verbally more. Uh, I realize she's able to bounce back from setbacks much faster than before. Um, recently, there was a setback in where she is. Um, it really, she was able to really come and express how sad and how uh, scared she was. However, uh, we saw that she could bounce back uh, much faster than what we first known her. And currently, she's also actively looking at resources beyond CSA, just like how she get herself accredited for her art skill. And now she's searching for something more because this is really good because the window of tolerance can only, can only be stretched uh, if you continue to search for something new that would um, allow you to learn and expand. Yeah. So she's doing this step by step. Not easy, she said. However, something that she's still uh, looking around and you not know, shopping around. So... One thing that I learned from her, she told me, life did not get any better, she realized. Like people always tell her, things will get better, things will get better. Well, she realized that as she grew up, things didn't get any better. Uh, she realized that it is the way that she coped, right? That makes it more manageable in her life now. So with that, um, honestly, we, all of us in the team really felt she has stretched. She herself acknowledged that also, that there's some resilience and adaptability uh, in her nervous system now that she can deal with things better. And the takeaway, uh, summing up in one slide for you, 
uh, is this key points. Uh, if you think there's too many, try something small first. So remember, seek support from safe and healthy relationship. Because if you are seeking support for someone safe and healthy, uh, they can regulate you a lot more better than someone who is also not doing too well. It's very hard to support and regulate your moods and emotion. Um, work in small steps. Hydrate the experience just like in the lab. You do not uh, suddenly mix the chemical and have a very big reaction. But we add the chemical a little bit at a time to ignite some form of uh, uh, experience here to see how it's working for the person. So take really small steps and very slowly. We realize that non-verbal creative approaches feel less threatening for the nervous system or the body, especially when it's talking about conveying very overwhelming sensation and feelings. And developing healthy coping methods really, really allow the person to stay in present and giving back to the community certainly create a sense of purpose uh, in a person like meaningfully engaged uh, in our life. Yeah. So with that, I uh, thank you for hearing me out. And I think there might be some questions coming in as well. This is just some of the platform where you can connect with us, whether it's on IG or FB. So feel free to take a snapshot of the picture if you want. Yeah. So I concluded my sharing and maybe we can look at the questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Thank you so much, Chui, and for sharing a real story. I think looking at a real story, it resonates with most of us, and it does show us that we can take some small steps to improve our um, health and well-being. Um, unfortunately, um, due to the, the, the gap, uh, we are run out of time for this session, so we will not be able to uh, answer the questions, but I'll, I'll send the questions to you later. If you'd like to um, uh, answer those, I'll share with the participants. Okay. Um, no problem. Yeah. Thank you so much.